I'd like to welcome everyone back from, I'll stand back a bit. Uh, welcome everyone back from what I hope has been a, an enriching, productive day at the various conference sessions. Um, again, for those who might have missed it earlier, I'm Julia Blakeney. I direct the Writing Center here at the Center for Writing Excellence. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our closing conference keynote speakers, Dr. Isis Art Artse Vega and um, Oscar Miranda Tapia. So Dr. Artse Vega is college provost and vice president for academic affairs at Valencia College in Central Florida. A little bit about Valencia College. Um, maybe you'll speak more to this. It's a Hispanic serving institution that serves about 70,000 students annually and has long been regarded as one of the nation's best community colleges. Um, ESIS provides strategic leadership for a variety of areas, including, take a deep breath before I list them all, <laughs> curriculum assessment, faculty development, distance learning, career and workforce education, and partnerships for educational equity. Prior to joining Valencia, um, ESIS served as an assistant vice president for teaching and learning at Florida International University. She has also taught English composition and enrollment management at the University of Miami. And her work is fueled by a commitment to equity and justice implemented through love and service. Oscar Miranda Tapia is assistant director for first generation student support services at Elon University. In this position, he is responsible for creating and developing Elon University's new first generation initiative. Since the initiative's establishment, Oscar has developed many campus partnerships and programming to advance first generation college student success. Prior to Elon, Oscar worked in residence life at Wheaton College in Massachusetts, and he also served as community impact fellow working with Alamance Achieves. Oscar's research interests are focused on college access and success, college affordability, diversity, equity, and inclusion, students with DACA, undocumented, first generation, and Latinx identities. Oscar received a BA in psychology from Elon University where he was a first generation student and a Golden Door and Odyssey scholar, and has also received a master's degree in education with a concentration in higher education from Harvard University. So our keynote speaker's presentation, Latinx Perspectives in, on Relationship Rich Education, draws on their forthcoming book, Your Relationship Rich Education, A Student Guide to Making Meaningful Connections in College, with co-authors Peter Felton and Leo Lambert. So warm welcome to our keynote speakers. Wow, thank you so much, um, you know, for this amazing opportunity. Um, you know, like I was so wonderfully introduced, uh, it's, it's, it's been an honor uh, to be here today, to be able to talk to you all a little bit about, you know, my uh, experience, a little bit about who I am, um, and more about this topic, um, Latinx Perspectives on Relationship Education. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about me, um, because I think it's important to uh, acknowledge positionality um, here. And so uh, a little bit about me, I was born in Mexico, um, but was raised in North Carolina. I, uh, for those of you who maybe are familiar with the DACA program, I I'm a DAC DACA recipient myself. Um, and so, you know, that played a big role um, in accessing college. And so uh, I was very fortunate enough um, to land a scholarship uh, here at Elon University where I went for undergrad. Um, it was an amazing experience uh, overall. And, and, you know, in my first year, uh, it was a pretty challenging experience at the same time. Um, growing up, I come from a lo low income household. Uh, and I grew up in Clayton, North Carolina. Uh, for those of you who maybe are familiar with the area, it's pretty rural, or at least back then it was a lot more rural um, before you know, folks started flocking to, to Raleigh now. Um, but, uh, you know, and so growing up in that area, I was very much used to uh, being uh, the only person of color, I think, in my classes, right? When I was in, in honors classes or AP classes, I was oftentimes the only Latino student in my class. And uh, I was very used to that. Um, however, when I got to Elon, um, I was you know, not surprised by the amount of uh, white students that existed at this institution. Um, but I was 
also uh, intrigued, uh, but I was much more intrigued by uh, the other Latino students that were also at this institution. Uh, growing up, you know, I didn't really have Latino friends um, that were in my classes, that looked like me. Um, I was not that student that played soccer. I was that uh, student athlete uh, that played football. Um, and oftentimes I just didn't have folks that looked like me that I could talk to about uh, my Latinidad, uh, my culture, uh, and you know, all the wonderful things that come with it. Uh, it was really Elon in my experience here talking to some of my other Latino peers that I began to learn more about Latinidad, um, what it means to be you know, a Latino, uh, a Mexican, um, and uh, you know, also attend my first quinceañera, if many of you know uh, what that is. And so it was an amazing experience. And so before I turn it over to, uh, to ECs, um, you may be wondering or asking yourselves, Latinx perspectives on relationship or education, why? H how did we get here? And so here, um, you know, first and foremost, ECs and I both share the Latinx identity. Um, and, you know, we thought, what a wonderful opportunity to be able to talk to uh, you all, the audience, about uh, that topic, about Latinx uh, identities, perspectives, um, and, you know, also considering the changes in demographics of, of the United States, right? Um, and what we will begin to see uh, as time goes on. And finally, it was also brought to our attention that uh, within engaged learning, uh, oftentimes uh, different perspectives, Latinx perspectives, uh, Latinos, Latinx identities, aren't always talked about. And so we wanted to make sure that, you know, we talk a little bit more about that within this presentation. So I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Isis. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Okay, from, oh. Uh, a couple of quick thoughts because the bio, again, was so extensive. I tried to get her to cut it down, but uh, she was very gracious and wanted to read it all. Uh, I'll just say I'm the daughter of Cuban immigrants in terms of my, uh, one of my key identities, uh, and born and raised in Miami, married to a Cuban immigrant as well. We now reside in Orlando. Um, like Oscar, I would say that my identity development and my ethnic identity development in particular followed a similar trajectory, mostly attended predominantly white institutions, and really didn't realize that I wasn't white until I left Miami and it was told to me in no <laughs> subtle terms. Uh, so I'll say, I'll say a couple of those things. Um, one quick uh, additional note before we jump in and give you an overview of our talk is to say, um, is to call your attention to the choice that we have made. And we have absolutely made the choice to use the word Latinx here. Not because it is the correct word or the right word that you should now take with you and use every time. Uh, that is absolutely not uh, what we are suggesting to you. Um, I think my, my suggestion here is that you approach the language that you use um, when referring to your Hispanic or Latino Latinx uh, students with intentionality. Um, that you look into the research and in the resources that we will share later and that will be circulated, you will see a, uh, an article um, that, that discusses at length all of the terminology that's used um, and, and the relationship between one choice or another and how it might shape the students that you serve. The uh, best way to refer to individuals of Latinx identities is to refer to, to ask and then use that. Right? Like there is no right answer. Um, Oscar says that he identifies as Latino. I identify as Latina or Cuban. I think a lot of people refer to me as Cuban, uh, even though I was born in Miami. So uh, here we wanted to share with you that we have chosen Latinx amongst the many options that exist because of its inclusion. Um, it is seen as one of the more inclusive terms. And then in our talk, you'll hear us naturally say things like Latina, Latino, um, or Hispanic because those are part of our um, lexicon as well. All right. So on the next slide, and I don't have the clicker. You can see we're out of practice. If I were on Zoom, this would be right here. I would be. <laughs> Thank you, Oscar. Um, on this slide, we wanted to just share what, uh, how we have designed the time together. Um, the, the book project was mentioned, so we'll talk a little bit about this beautiful book um, that Peter and Leo wrote and uh, their invitation for Oscar and I to join them in this next phase of the project. I want to talk a little bit about this idea of identity consciousness. Um, it is now increasingly discussed in higher ed circles, and so I want to talk in broad terms about what it looks like, what it means, and some concerns that have been raised. Because thinking about Latinx students in particular is a form of identity consciousness um, that I am inviting you to, to practice with today. Um, we will share with you some of our Latinx student voices that we gathered via the book project. 
Um, and then I'm going to ask um, to, for you to engage in partnership with one another and then as a whole group in practicing what it might look like to take a Latinx specific approach to engage learning research and practice. So that is what we have planned and then we should have plenty of time for questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Oscar. Got it. Thank you, Isis. Um, so, okay, go. Um, so, like Isi said, I uh, want to talk a to you all a little bit about, uh, you know, this amazing book uh, written by Leo Lamberts and Peter Felton. I see Peter in the back. I want to give him a shout out. Um, <laughs> so this session relates back to, you know, a, a book that Leo and Peter wrote back in fall of 2020 called Relationship Bridge Education. Um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this book, um, but if you're not, uh, one of the biggest ideas in the book, uh, main points is that relationships in college matter. Um, it's the relationships between students and faculty, students and staff members, students and other students uh, that, are, that play in critical factors uh, to student success. And so uh, for those of you who you know, are pretty familiar with, with the research on relationships, um, you'll know that it's not uh, a new concept. However, what I particularly love about this book um, is the, the use of diverse voices, narratives um, in it. He, in the book, uh, we hear from stories, uh, stories from faculty, staff, institutional leaders, students themselves at very diverse institutions, from public institutions, two-year institutions, private, public, big and small institutions, online institutions, and um, we, in particular, hear from our uh, new majority students. Students, you know, that uh, are students of color, first-generation college students. We hear from non-traditional students. Um, we also hear from students that are also parents. We hear from students that are taking classes fully online. And we get to hear about, uh, you know, their experiences in their college campuses around relationships and how much uh, those matter to them. And so, uh, Peter, what Peter and Leo did, they gathered all these interviews uh, and synthesized that with the research on relationships. Uh, and we arrive at four principles, which I will talk to you all about today. The first um, is, you know, quite a no-brainer uh, if you know the research on belonging and mattering, and that's that all students must experience a, a genuine sense of welcome and deep care. Um, when I think about our Latinx students, for example, uh, in particular, our students that also identify as first generation, we know uh, that it can be intimidating at times to uh, go into college, go into a new space, um, and have to interact with you know, scholarly leaders, uh, PhD holders, uh, faculty on campus, institutional leaders, and so it can be quite intimidating. And so this particular uh, point, uh, this, this principle, um, is very foundational to this kind of work. Uh, in order for students to be able to succeed, they must feel that sense of genuine welcome and deep care. And, uh, you know, I know that this uh, can be pretty challenging for some students at times if they feel like their faculty member or their staff member um, doesn't care about them. Or maybe it's just going into a job nine to five, clocking in and clocking out, and, and, and takes no interest in getting to know them. So this principle um, is, is huge. The second principle is that relationships um, are powerful means to inspire students to learn. It's through relationships between you know, students, faculty, staff, and peers that we begin to build trust with students. Um, and we begin to have more vulnerable conversations about uh, their, their personal lives, what's happening back home, uh, some of their dreams and aspirations. And we can begin to have more conversations, deeper conversations in their academics about potential career paths, ways of navigating um, higher education institutions. And finally, uh, the third principle um, is that students don't just need one mentor in their uh, college uh, experience. That in fact, what they need is a web of significant relationships. Um, what one uh, scholar um, calls a constellation of mentors. Um, folks that exist in a college student's experience uh, think of faculty, staff, community members, family even, that can provide uh, different kinds of support uh, so that students can succeed. And then the last principle um, is that in order for students to have a transformative experience in, in, undergraduate, in their undergraduate experience, um, they need to have relationships that really ask them the big questions, right? 
who are they becoming, for whom, and for why. Um, and uh, so those are the four principles. Uh, and um, the book was so well received uh, you know, by other folks in the field um, that uh, we've decided, you know, how can we get this uh, important information about the relationships, the benefits of having relationships to the, to the hands of students? How do we make sure that they know about this? And so this is where ECs and I um, have partnered with Leo uh, and Peter to write a second book uh, where the target audience is students. And um, we uh, talk to students about, you know, talk to us about those significant relationships that you had in undergrad. Uh, what made them so special? How did you uh, go about creating those uh, relationships? Talk to us about who's in your constellation of mentors. Uh, and we begin to create a guide uh, so that students know, other students know, uh, the benefit of these relationships and how they can create a relationship-rich uh, experience for themselves. And so um, at this time, too, we needed to acknowledge, right, that 2020 was, uh, a lot was happening then uh, from a contentious election, from a pandemic, and students having to transition onto a Zoom format. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, the continuous murders of our black citizens here in the United States. And so we needed to uh, center the voices of students and ask them, you know, how have you been doing? What's been going on? Um, how has, you know, all the things that have been happening um, around you impacted the way that you've uh, interacted with faculty, interacted with staff members. And so we set out to talk to more students about their experience, and it's those students that we interviewed, the same students that we're gonna talk to you all about um, today. Uh, it's in this session that we'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of the Latinx students that we interviewed, um, and we'll hear a little bit about what they have to say um, as far as their experience with, with relationships in college. So I'm gonna turn it back over to ECs. Thank you, Oscar. And so I know you are eager to hear our student voices and uh, we are eager to share them with you. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of identity consciousness. Um, it, it may seem uh, intuitive, but I'll just say briefly, if we are and when we are identity conscious in our work, um, we are not taking a, a one-size-fits-all approach, right? We are uh, thinking and we are hypothesizing that a, an identity like Latinidad um, is salient enough that it's useful as a construct for doing our work. Um, doesn't mean it's homogenous, doesn't mean all Latinos are created equal, but it does mean that there are enough commonalities amongst this identity that it helps us be more intentional and strategic and focused in our efforts. So if that's what identity consciousness means, then why do Oscar and I bring it forth to you? Of why do we think uh, it is helpful? And, and I'll outline three reasons. So I would argue that identity consciousness is key to advancing educational equity. Um, educational equity has become a buzz term of late, I will acknowledge that. Uh, but we are hearing strong consensus in the field that educational equity is when we recognize that equality doesn't really work because um, our students' lived experiences, their backgrounds, their contexts are not equal. Uh, so again, strong consensus in the field that in order to achieve equal outcomes for students, which is really what the construct of equity leads us to, we must differentiate how we serve them, how we create conditions for their learning. And in that differentiation, this is a tool the tool of identity consciousness is a form of differentiation. It's a form of acknowledging that all students' experiences and backgrounds are not equal. So that's one. I think that identity consciousness is key to us doing our equity work. Um, secondly, I will say, and I'll draw on um, my, my dear friends and their book called Moving from, from Equity Talk to Equity Walk. I think I added a word in there. From Equity Talk to Equity Walk, um, where uh, the authors make the point that part of what equity-minded practitioners do when we do our work well is that we are specific in our terminology and that we avoid euphemisms and we avoid proxies for race and ethnicity. Often we don't want to say black students, Latino students. We shy away from it. We say underserved, uh, underrepresented. We use first gen as a proxy. We refer to their socioeconomic background. So identity consciousness invites us um, and encourages us to say, this isn't just a strategy or an approach for all students. 
or for our underserved or minority or minoritized students. I am in fact talking about our Latino students and that is okay, right? So, so that is, um, again, a key skill set that is associated with uh, effective equity-minded practice. The third argument that I would make for our use of uh, identity consciousness is not a sophisticated one. Uh, and it, it, it is simply that we want our strategies to work, right? Um, I will share that uh, a long time ago, the California system, which has been engaged in equity work longer than most uh, states and institutions, um, required that all of the colleges in the system create equity strategies. And you know, uh, fast forward to uh, a time when the, those equity strategies had been designed, vetted, funded, and implemented, and a group of scholars went in to say, did they work, right? To examine the outcomes of those equity strategies. What they found is that they hadn't. And when they dig more deeply and they looked at the strategies that had been used to advance those more equitable outcomes, the strategies were generic, right? How will we help our Latinx and black students achieve uh, progress at the same levels of other students? We will keep the writing center open longer hours, right? It didn't work. It was never going to work. A one size fits all for a, a, a gap or a distinction that, that is telling you in the data, we differ, we're different in terms of identity. Identity is a relevant variable here. That is what our data are telling us. They are not telling us about students' potential, about the, what they are capable of doing. What they are saying, as we uh, have, have come to, to use at Valencia, we aren't, have not yet created the conditions in which students who identify as Latinx can be successful. That's on us. We have not yet created the conditions in which our black students can thrive at the same levels, right? That's on us. So identity consciousness is both, uh, it, it is at once key to advancing equitable outcomes. Um, uh, it requires the sophistication and a willingness and a courage to say what we're talking about and to be explicit, and also makes it more likely that our strategies are going to work. Um, of course, as with anything, there are concerns being raised, right? As soon as we, uh, this happens often when institutions become HSI or Hispanic serving institutions, um, that a group of students will say, what about me? I don't identify as Latino. Does that mean that I no longer matter here, right? Does that mean that now all of the institutional resources and strategies will become so Hispanic student or Latinx specific that they won't apply to me and that I won't fit here? Um, I, I would uh, point you to a book called, uh, So You Wanna Talk About Race, um, offers a beautiful description about how when we engage in race consciousness, right, which is associated, right, as it is uh, a neighbor to identity consciousness, then um, we are not saying one thing or one identity is more important than another. What we are saying is that it is distinct enough that it warrants our separate attention. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that again. Not because you take an, an ex-specific approach, it means that all of a sudden this is the only identity or sets of identities that are important to you, but rather that for whatever reasons, right, and they may be demographic, they may be coming from your data, you find this variable and identity salient enough to focus some time and energy. Um, so this concern about a reverse discrimination has been raised, so I wanted to, to bring that to you. Um, so then how do we engage in identity consciousness? Um, I won't oversimplify, I, I will oversimplify a bit, um, but I would say one of the ways is in um, that question that I shared uh, regarding what we are asking ourselves now at Valencia as an example, right? Um, so one of our guiding principles at Valencia is that anyone can learn anything under the right conditions. And so then when we looked at our data, we asked that more specific and narrow version of that question, how do we create the conditions in which more of our Latinx students can be successful? Right? How do we create the conditions? It means you ask yourself, not how will we improve equity or student success for all, but you ask a more focused question. The second general way to engage in identity conscious thinking, programming, design thinking, however you, you want to move it forward, and the only way that it will work, frankly, is if you do so with authenticity. Um, here I draw on the work uh, isolated, that is uh, summarized in a book called Why Aren't We There Yet? Uh, taking personal responsibility for creating inclusive campuses. And this is uh, research of a, of a number of student affairs uh, professionals who were so excited um, that enough time had elapsed between diversity initiatives, as they were called, right, in colleges and universities, 
many of these diversity initiatives housed in student affairs programs. And they were so excited to uh, look at the data and to see what, uh, what the impacts had been. And like with the California uh, work that I referenced, they were disappointed. They were disappointed and they sought to not just be disappointed, right, as good scholars, uh, but to understand what went wrong. What did we do, what as practitioners, what did we not do or what did we not do enough of? And here, one of their working hypotheses and, and kind of arguments in the book is that part of why we aren't there yet is that we were so excited to try out strategies and top 10 ideas um, and uh, innovations and, and is that we, we didn't stop and recognize that when we engage with our students whose identities differ from ours, who's there in the room? We are. We're there. And we are not neutral agents in that space. Our identities and our associations and our biases, whether we recognize them or not, are in there and they shape the effectiveness of our practices. And so they argued that practitioners in student affairs, they skipped ahead. They were excited and they didn't realize that they hadn't done their work, their reflecting and looking inward to identify some of the ways that they were implementing uh, their efforts toward equity without even recognizing that, that they were shaping the, the work itself. Yeah, does that make sense? And so because I didn't want that to happen to you in your efforts to uh, advance equity and take a Latinx uh, specific approach if you so decide, um, I wanted to take the next couple of slides to guide you through, or the next slide to guide you through a quiet personal reflection associated with Latinx identities. And next, just to share a couple of thoughts about the kinds of associations that are prevalent. Yeah. So here we go. On this next slide, again, quiet. Nobody will ask you to share anything. This is personal. So you, it's just between you and you. If you want to write it down, that's fine. But nobody's looking. All right, so when you think about Latinx individuals, and you put the term here that resonates for you. If you think of, of us as Latino and that's, uh, or Hispanic, put that term in for yourself, because it's your reflection, not mine. What comes to mind? Kind of like word association. I say Latino, you say. You don't have to say. OK. What about this one? Um, what are some positive associations that you or others, right? Maybe you have had limited opportunities to engage um, with Latinx individual students, but you know that others have these positive associations. You've heard of these good things. You have, you have something? No? Okay. What about this one? What are some negative associations that you or others have uh, regarding Latinx individuals. And you, even if you are sure they're not true and you don't like to think about them, you know, bring them up to your mind just for a second. I want to share with you some common ones. Uh, and uh, in terms of positive associations, I would say that perhaps the most uh, well-established, regarded uh, framework around uh, Latino strengths comes from Tara Yoso's work on uh, community cultural wealth. So in the references, you'll have a link to her great article. I won't go into detail, uh, but part of what uh, she uh, posits and articulates so beautifully in this piece are kinds of strengths, categories of strengths, familial strengths, linguistic strengths, navigational strengths, etc. So those might be some of the positive associations that came to you. In terms of negative associations, um, there are many, and I will say that the prior administration uh, put many of them forth in more explicit terms than had been the case uh, for quite some time. Uh, so our limited English abilities, right, our, our uh, challenges with the English language, uh, documentation, right, and, and illegality, uh, laziness, dangerous. Uh, here is just a, 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 an education-specific idea uh, from, a, from a major uh, news periodical, which referred to the changing demographic tide as a tidal wave. Um, I, I don't know about you, but that scares me. Uh, and so we are scary, and we are coming forth in the form of a tidal wave. Um, just some of the ways that negative associations become disseminated um, in the media. And here, 
Um, this was again uh, in March to, in, in 2017, um, but, but this really resonated uh, because the impact of these negative associations, it manifests itself like small little uh, burns or ticks, right? It is often not egregious, uh, but the author Valeria Luiselli articulated in this way that there are small but very profound layers of humiliation attached to a nationality that is assumed to be criminal and inferior, right? This is, this is some of the language that, um, right, is, 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 is out there, and we hear it and we feel it, um, and, and we imagine that you do too. And so with that reflection um, in mind, um, we are, hey, I'm gonna shift, but I'm not, because the clicker's not gonna let me. It's okay. Uh, we are going to uh, share some of our Latinx student voices, but we also wanted to give you the benefit of the question that we will be posing to you afterwards to talk to one another about, and, and hopefully we'll have a large group discussion. So please have this question in your mind as Oscar guides us through um, our, uh, these students that we had the honor of speaking to and their lived experiences as they described them. What might it look like? to center Latinx student experiences in your engaged learning or practice, right? Even if you had never thought about it, um, what could it look like? And, and so some of you who are doing this already, we hope to hear um, what you are doing as well. So this is the question, hold it in your mind. Uh, maybe take some notes while you hear our student voices and then we will come back to it um, after, uh, after Oscar uh, guides us through that process. Awesome, thank you, Isis. Um, so in this next section, we're gonna present you all, you know, some stories from some students that we, we talked to um, in the making of, of the second book. And so uh, this first student uh, goes by the name of Abraham, um, and I'm gonna provide a little bit of context uh, before I ask uh, one of you all in the audience to read uh, a little bit about what Abraham had uh, shared with us. And so Abraham um, is attending a two-year community college, um, and uh, they, at the time when we were interviewing them, was 24 years old, first generation college student. Um, and, uh, you know, they began telling us about their undergraduate experience at their two year institution. And as they were navigating it, they came to a certain point uh, in that undergraduate experience where uh, they left school, they dropped out. Um, and, you know, that's a quite often experience um, for some of our students. And so, uh, you know, immediately after Abraham dropped out of school, began working a job, uh, trying to make ends meet, uh, began working as a car salesman. And, uh, you know, making money on the side. Uh, but then after doing that for some time, uh, Abraham uh, realized that, you know, they got the sense that there's more to life than just selling cars, um, that they wanted to do more, uh, have more of an impact in the world. And so they thought, well, what if I just go back to school? Um, but there was a particular moment um, where uh, it inspired Abraham to go back to school. And so I want to share with you all a little bit of the words um, that uh, Abraham shared with us as to, you know, what was that, that tipping point for him. So uh, could I have Ros Susanna in the audience please read uh, to us a little bit about what Abraham shared with us. One of the things I took to heart was seeing the path my family was taking. As a first generation college student, I don't have anyone who is in the same shoes seeking a college degree. So when I looked around at home, I felt that we deserved better and that somebody needs to spark the change for my nephews and nieces and for the rest of my family. I decided that I should be the one to do it. I can't sit around and wait for someone else to do it. I want to be the change, and I want my nephews and nieces to say, he went out, he went out and did it. So here, um, you know, I'm sure many of us have heard, uh, Linux students uh, very much uh, you know, tight-knit with their families, and, and the importance that family can have on a student's experience. And so here, uh, we see that uh, Abraham's family indirectly uh, you know, he put pressure on himself to go back to school because he wanted a better life, not just for himself, but also for his family. In fact, he points to his family being his nieces and nephews. And so it begins, it, it, uh, I would challenge us to think about, you know, who, who when students think about their family, you know, who, who comes to their mind? Um, and what kind of 
influence can those family members have on a student's uh, trajectory? In this case, uh, you know, they pushed him to go back to school. Um, and uh, we see that uh, in this example, um, but at the same time, you know, we, uh, in Abraham's example, we see a, a different dynamic also play at play here. And so if I could have Susanna again read this second uh, story, I would appreciate it as well. The expectation in my household is to just get your high school diploma and find yourself a job to start making money. So during my first year in college, my parents never really pushed me to pass or anything like that. They said, you went and you gave it a try, so good job. I didn't really have any support from them at home. So here we see an interesting dynamic where on one end, uh, we have the family indirectly, you know, pushing the student to go back to school. Um, but at the same time, we see this other dynamic where, uh, you know, as much as uh, the student wants to go back to school, sometimes the parents uh, aren't able to be able to help support that student uh, in that part of their journey. Uh, like I mentioned before, Abraham was a first generation college student. Their parents had uh, not attended uh, college. And so they didn't perhaps know how to quite uh, support him through that. Um, the other thing I wanna mention here is that you know this is Abraham's experience? Uh, the last thing that I would want you all to take away from this is that not you know all Latino families do not support their their children. That is far uh, from the truth. Uh, there are many of them that you know want to help support their students, but oftentimes maybe they don't know how. Um, and so, as we're thinking um, about uh, students, uh, our work, our own roles, uh, we can't disregard the piece around family. In my own line of work, I've seen how the family can have a big impact on a student's experience. When I, I'm working with first-generation college students, for example, maybe a family member wants a student to take on a particular career path or a particular major, um, and there's this added pressure for them to do uh, things in a certain way. Um, and so we have to reflect inward and say, you know, what, what am I seeing here with our students, with our students, uh, and is, is family playing a role in here, or, or is it not? Um, and how does that play out uh, for that student in their experience? So um, for our next student, uh, Paula. Uh, Paula is an honors student in, uh, at their particular institution. They were born in Mexico, raised in Miami, and uh, they're an outstanding student. Uh, they are going to uh, be applying to uh, medical school this upcoming cycle, 2023. Um, as I mentioned before, they were an honors student and uh, they also served as a, a learning assistant in uh, one of their classes. And so in that role, they had an amazing opportunity to be able to interact with some of their peers and help them, um, you know, help influence some of the learning. Uh, and she loved that about that role. Uh, so much so that, you know, uh, she loved having those conversations with students um, and vice versa, but at the same time, uh, her peers also provided her uh, a, an added layer of, of support for her. Um, and so here I wanna point us to the, the, uh, the impact that peers can have on our own learning. Um, so if I could have Melanie yes. in the audience, please read uh, this story. I built a lot of meaningful relationships with the people in that fraternity because they were all pre-med students. We were all going the same way. I had friends that were incredibly smart, borderline genius, and that also drove me to be like, okay, I can do this. I also had a lot of mentorship from my big in the fraternity who got accepted into medical school. So I would ask her all the time about the medical school application process. Sometimes I got so overwhelmed and I would call her crying thinking, what if I don't get accepted? I've also had people from my fraternity tutor me through the hardest subjects, but I got through it because I had friends from that fraternity in that same class. There was a mini section of the club in the class. We got to help each other for study for, study for the test. Thank you. So here I want to point out you know, uh, the impact that students' peers can have um, on their learning. Uh, here in this example, we see that you know, Paula was able to have other peers that were also in the same track as her, wanting to go into medical school, um, and that she could lean on them to talk to her about uh, the college application process, uh, learning more um, about that process. Uh, we also see here that you know, at times, uh, she could lean on her peers uh, and talk to her about some of her fears about potentially not getting accepted um, and what that would look like. Uh, and so peers 
can have a huge impact on students' uh, experiences in college. And uh, you know, for Latinx students and other students alike, uh, we wanted to, to make sure that we, we highlight that as well. So uh, for our next student, um, if they attend a two-year institution, um, first-generation college student as well, born in Mexico, uh, but raised uh, you know, the majority of their life here in the United States. Uh, and this particular student um, got into college, uh, and they were also accepted into a program uh, that supports first-generation college students. And in order to be a part of this program, you needed to attend a summer bridge program during the summer. And so uh, in this next slide, we're going to hear from Olegaria um, and hear her story about uh, her first interaction with a college professor during that summer bridge program. So for this story, could I please have uh, Peter read this to us? For me, talking to a professor in college was hard. I thought, how do I approach a professor in college? How do I ask for help? I don't want to seem ignorant in front of them. After a few tries of me trying to approach the professor, he approached me and says, Oligaria, I've seen that you are one of the students that stays quiet, and I noticed you don't want to ask for help, but just know that I'm the professor. I'm here to help you. I'll not force you to ask for help if you don't want to, but if you need to, please do so. Afterwards, I felt more confident. The fact that he approached me when I was struggling with a few math problems really opened the door for me to think professors in college are normal people just like me. <laughs> They're not going to put me down or think I'm ignorant. My mindset changed. I thought to myself, college professors are really different than when I thought they were. Thank you so much. So here, um, you know, as is the, uh, the circumstance for you know our students, uh, first-generation college students, oftentimes they don't know how to approach uh, a faculty member or staff member. They're intimidated, um, and for Olegaria, um, you know, perhaps they had heard in in their K-12 system, you know, from some of their teachers that you know professors in college aren't going to care about you, uh, that they're not going to hold your hand, that they're not going to do X, Y, Z, uh, and that can you know have that can really change a student's perspective uh, later in college when, th when they're trying to interact with, with a faculty member. Um, the other thing uh, that I want to highlight here is that within this upcoming book, we really want students to take away that the fact that asking for help um, is a sign of strength and not a sign of weakness and that we as faculty members or staff members, institutional leaders uh, can have a huge impact uh, in helping students be able to make that ask for help. Um, here we see that that professor uh, reached out to the student directly, noticed something about the student, uh, and tried to bring you know, the student's walls down so that they can have an uh, interactive conversation uh, that could later lead to you know, more support uh, academically. The other thing I want to, to point out here is that oftentimes some of our students, um, like I said before, are intimidated uh, to talking to their professors. But there exists a power dynamic right, in our classrooms between faculty members standing up, uh, saying all, you know, spitting all this knowledge out to students, um, and students taking in that information, but oftentimes not questioning it or asking for, for more uh, of, their, of the professors. And you know, with our Latinx students, um, oftentimes, uh, as well as other cultures, oftentimes that dynamic between an authoritative figure at the front of the classroom uh, can have a huge impact on whether or not they interact um, and engage. So those are the, uh, the student stories um, that we wanted to share with you all today. And so like EC's mentioned earlier, there's a question that we wanted you all to reflect on. And so I'm going to pass it back over to EC's um, to take us into that session. Thank you so much, Oscar. Um, so we, it was hard for us to choose among the many voices that we gathered uh, and heard from our Latinx students. It, again, was, was such an honor to engage in that research. And here we brought, those two, we brought these three examples to you. Um, uh, one, to complicate this uh, idea of familialism, right? It has almost become, uh, you know, oh, of course, they love their family, as if it were simple and, and not uh, laden with complexity, right? And, and kind of uh, uh, both um, motivations and very literal, tangible support, uh, as, as I had uh, all of my upbringing, um, in, and also some forces that sometimes can, can run counter 
um, and, and for varying intentions, as Oscar described. Um, peers, we wanted to lift up the role of peers in uh, Latinx uh, conscious and in doing our equity work. Um, many institutions are uh, striving diligently to diversify faculty, right, so that students see their identities validated in their faculty members. Um, and if you're wondering if it makes a difference, I will say as the only Latina professor that many of my students had when they told me that time and time again, um, what an enormous difference it made for them to see me in my role. Um, and now um, uh, staff and professionals uh, say the same thing. It, it, it does seem to make a big difference. Uh, but that's okay. Um, uh, someone asked me when I spoke last week, do you think that a mostly white pro uh, faculty can advance equitable outcomes? Absolutely, 100%. Um, I don't question that for a moment. Uh, that intentionality and that authenticity are key. Uh, and so students are also, uh, as, as their demographic profile changes, one of the good things that I can say is that it may be uh, take us longer to diversify faculty, but students are diverse and they can support one another and it can be easier for them to establish trust with one another because they are closer in their identities. So leveraging students and peer-to-peer -peer connections and work um, can be another idea and we heard that in our students' uh, experiences. And then finally, this recognition that you and our faculty members are key players and that relationships are not optional. Um, they are almost a prerequisite to learning, whether it's engaged learning or it's disciplinary learning. That relationship and that trust is really foundational to everything that will follow. And so you might think, I don't have the luxury or the time. I have to work on my engaged learning research and practice. I will say it really won't work as effectively as it can unless you work on that relational. Students come in as three-dimensional humans, um, as we know it, and not as, as empty vessels. So with that, I'm gonna ask you to spend about five minutes maybe talking to a partner. And it might be tempting to talk at your table, but I do want each of you to benefit from this thinking. So maybe five minutes to talk to a partner about this question. You've heard about these ideas regarding identity consciousness and Latinx student uh, specific approaches, and you heard some voices. Uh, what might it look like for you to center Latinx students in your engaged learning research and or practice? Take about five minutes. Hello. We're gonna bring it back. We're so Thank sorry. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for engaging in this 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 question. Appreciate your time. Um, so uh, we're looking at the time, um, and we want to make sure that you all have enough time to ask us questions. And so, uh, but before we do that, could we have uh, some time to be able to talk a little bit about you know what you all discuss at your tables? Uh, we have our fellow colleague over here, Peter, who has a microphone. So if anyone would like to share what they discussed, we'd love to hear more about that. You just raise your hand if you have something to say, and Peter will walk right over to you. Hello, uh, Michael Robbins from Valencia College. Uh, so one of the things we talked about in terms of engaged learning practices had to do with the uh, uh, something we saw throughout the student experiences, which was sort of demystifying educational practices. Uh, I told Shara that I call it the educational boogeyman, that at every level there's another boogeyman. So when you're in third grade, they say your fourth grade teacher is not going to play the way I'm playing. Uh, th it, when they hit college, that boogeyman becomes the college professor. And so in one of the stories you shared, there was the student who felt that they couldn't ask questions until the professor eventually demystified the idea that they are uh, a scary figure in the classroom. And so in terms of centering this on engaged learning practices, I would say one of the first things we can do is demystify that notion that we are not a figure to be talked to or that we're not going to be understanding, essentially humanizing us uh, as, a, as a faculty. So that was one of the first thoughts I had. Thank you, Michael. I love that. Part, part of what I heard in your response um, was also this um, idea that Oscar and I talked about earlier engaged learning or one of the specific names for whatever engaged learning practice you are um, uh, uh, trying to, to advance or, or that's another boogeyman to use Michael's word. That's another weird thing that I don't know about so maybe I won't be good at it and no thank you, um, right? So our terminology uh, and the fact that it, that it uh, is often not intuitive what we mean um, it can seem scary, right? Undergraduate research, maybe not. Uh, and so being really transparent and open and maybe thinking about the language we use when describing these opportunities um, might be another extension of, of, of uh, that thought. Yeah. 
I agree with that point. You know, making sure that it's clear to students what the value is of maybe an undergraduate uh, research experience, um, or you know, the value of hey, talking to your professors might be very beneficial uh, because I might be one of the people that writes your letter of recommendation down the road for graduate school. Uh, you know, explaining, demystifying some of those uh, is very helpful uh, to students. Something else you discuss at your tables or a question that came up at your table. You kept looking Thank you. So um, I'm Michelle Eady, and I'm from the University of Wollongong in Australia. And I know that there's some colleagues in the room that are from here from different parts of the world, where um, I'd like to challenge the idea of um, it's not so much, I think, uh, a cultural shift. We've been talking about a cultural shift a lot today about what happens in universities. But can we actually shift culture? So what I mean is, in some places in the world, it's not just a boogeyman, it's culture, the way that universities are run, and how students come into that culture and the respect that is paid to the university professor, and the relationship part is not really a piece that's ever spoken about. So I think from a university, uh, from, sorry, from a um, North American perspective, we can set an example about how to shift that cultural, that cultural shift within universities. But still, I think we still need to be open-minded about is it really possible to shift a whole culture um, and, and to think about a different way that universities should be. I'm buying in, I'm 100%. I'm open door students that might I'll go to weddings. I've been to more baptisms in my you know, career since I've been a university professor than I've ever been in my personal life. But I, I've also seen, you know, uh, from a world perspective, that, that there's just something to think about. It's just some food for thought, yeah? So uh, I, I think it's a, it's a wonderful point, if I'm understanding correctly, right? Because there's a, com a complexity there I want to acknowledge. Um, and, and part of what I'm hearing is this recognition that, on the one hand, we want to empower and be honest with our students about the institutional cultures they're entering as is. And on the other hand, we want to do what we can in our power to change parts of our culture that we find to be problematic or not welcoming or not inclusive or obscure, right? So I think both of these um, we work on in parallel. Uh, and I think that seems crucial. I'm so happy that you raised your hand because in your session, um, you had an example, a really excellent example of identity consciousness where indigenous students um, were being placed in work experiences and they said, don't place us here. This is, doesn't matter enough to us. Here in our society, in, in, in our region, we see all of these opportunities for us to advance our values and, and sense of purpose. Um, place us there in your work-based experience, and we will be more successful, and we will thrive. So I thought that was a really beautiful example of identity consciousness um, that you shared with us earlier. Thank you. There's an actual paper in that IJ Will special issue, and it's called Being Maori is a, My Superpower. Yes, so being Maori yes. is my superpower is the title of that chapter, and so I feel like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Lots of resonance there. Now we are really, really coming up against the end, and we want to give you a chance to ask us questions, not and not just respond to this question we posed to you. So I think we have time for a couple. Is that okay? Just. Thank you. Thank you both so much for this amazing presentation. And I love hearing about Orlando. I grew up in Orlando, so I, this Yay. is very close to my heart. Um, I, and I also love that you're working on the book for students, right? And with the complexity of Latinidad and Latinx identity, I wonder like, if and how you're, when you're talking about these issues with students who are Latinx students, how you are addressing those complexities of like what Latinidad means. Like you started by talking about Latinx and how that's an expansive um, term, and you know Latinx communities still encompass a lot of anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity. Yes. So like, how do you talk about that with students in, in this book or in, in your work? I would love to learn. Thank you. I, I want to pass it to Oscar, but I want to first say um, that Peter reminded us that the book for students will be available for free, open access to students. So I uh, just wanted to be really excited and to share that with you. Thank you. Oscar. Yeah, so um, you know, when we talk to students, uh, we, we made sure to have that conversation around uh, you know, 
how does how's your identity kind of played into this? Um, and uh, for some students, uh, it was very, uh, it played a big role. Um, and uh, that's one of the, I think, one of the areas that like I personally would have loved for us to go perhaps even deeper in, uh, into talking about, you know, what does it look like, uh, you know, we have this, this, you have maybe a Mexican background, um, but let's talk about, you know, what it means to be Latino or Latinx uh, in a different co context, a different nationality. Um, and so, I mean, you raise a very interesting point, uh, one that uh, we can certainly have, you know, put more of an emphasis on. Um, unfortunately, you know, we, there's only so much that, you know, we could have said. Um, and explored, um, and, and you know, we try to make sure that students were at least aware um, in the book that you know there's folks on campus that they can reach out to to have some of some of these more uh, in-depth, deeper conversations. Um, so that's what I'll say there. And you're absolutely right, right? Um, as as I shared was my experience. Often students come to college without having had those those uh, opportunities to learn about their identities. It, it, you might you know it might seem un unfathomable, fathomable, that I got to uh, North Carolina for my undergraduate years and, and, and was suddenly non-white because non-whiteness was told to me, um, right? And, and it, was, it was told to me in, in a number of forms. Uh, but in fact, it was a really powerful learning moment for me and part of why um, I began this journey of understanding and seeking to be um, culturally responsive and humble in the work that I did afterwards. Um, we want to thank you for sticking around. We know we were the last thing, uh, the last session of the conference. Appreciate all of your thoughtful attention, um, your conversations as Oscar shared. It was clear you were really getting into it. Um, and we sh uh, have our uh, email addresses on one of the slides and, and we'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, and again, the resources um, that we recommend are highlighted there as well. Thank you so much. Thank you all.